Endurance E-Racing World Championship Le Mans 24 Hours is brought to you by ESR Esports Network, Fleet Gaming, Sim Lab, Cusingfeld, Simplexity, ASTIC, and AMD Ryzen Radio. GDR 24 hours, the final race of Endurance E Racing World Championship, live from Circuit de la Sarthe, Le Mans, as it's better known all around the globe. We are in the French Plains, in the French countryside, and we are still racing. We just let Ewan O'Leary to sleep from the computer booth here for a little bit, of course, getting his well earned rest. And well, it's gonna be a man named Alex joining me in the computer booth. So, how are you, Skinner? <laughs> it's been a long, long time since I've had the pleasure of working with you, Ossian, and I am so happy to have been able to be put on the broadcast at this moment in time. Four in the morning here in fr uh, northern France here at the Circuit de la Sarthe. And of course, I get to work with an amazing Oss uh, amazing and rather crazy Finn <laughs> alongside me on the broadcasting desk. And for a start, how are you, my man? It's been so, so long. Well, you know, I've been mostly fine i'm feeling thank you and uh, it's really it's been great honestly working uh, with this event once more being live last year at denmark was an experience certainly doing the broadcast from there being all with all those crazy guys you know uh, <laughs> i mean nick newcomb is gonna spring to mind of course a uh, couple of other folks as well names escape me as they tend to do at 5 a.m but you know that's life and we had all the mountain dew we can drink as well so that was <laughs> that was great i never want to see another bottle again i'm kidding it's a great drink if you need some refreshment gotta keep those uh you can send me some free samples it's all right so you know uh, going full, full sellout at this uh, early moment of the race but yeah it's been an exciting race and alex you've been already doing a couple of stints here and since you since we last saw or since you rather last saw this race the rain started to fall and it through everything on its head. I was about to say, the last time I was, well, I was even saying, the last time I was awake was before the rain came down. And, well, let's put it this way. Ernest Lappins wasn't in second in LMP2. That driller's car was very far down the order. So, and also the fact the 334 is now <laughs> leading this race. I heard that the five car had a disconnect, but I didn't think it affected them that badly. Yeah. But I mean, that's not what happens easily uh, when the rain starts to fall and when you start to make it, maybe make a couple of mistakes. We saw Enzo Fassi crashing out all on his own. Uh, we saw the five car having a disconnect. And as a result of that, it is the number 334, Chris Gonzalez of Fair Racing Team that is leading the LMP2 class. So that's incredible. They are currently sitting in sixth place overall, but I don't think you care really about overall classification. It's all about the class positions. And you know what? For all the flack, their driver lineup may have gotten from some teams pre-race, uh, not saying it directly, but some teams were like, you know, they don't have that strong drivers. I don't think they're gonna be a threat. Well, look who's leading now. Look who's laughing now. Oh, I think we've all been a bit laughing mad tonight, Ossian. And of course, the early hours of the morning bring out the early hours of the comedic broadcasting, of course. We've got to try and keep everyone entertained somehow. Some cars are getting close on track, though. The ProSim, the 007, and Ernest Lapp is only separated by seven and a half seconds now. And those times are sort of, they're sort of trading lap times at the moment, Ossian, as Ryan Nash and Dennis Jordan make their way down the pit lane, the Burst Age Esports car making their way in with Dennis Jordan at the wheel. Good to see the nighttime driver. Also the wet weather driver making his appearance here for the first time this event. Meanwhile, second place, uh, L1 on hypercar. Ibrahim Khan has just made his way into the pit lane as well. Yeah, that they have done so, you know, a lot of a lot of traffic turned pit lane. Of course, we are at roughly the top of the hour, so that's when you expect it. But with the rain coming down and with so many crashes happening and so on, it's actually surprising to see some teams still able to make pit stops when you expect them to do. But yeah, trading lap times, that's always a good thing uh, in my mind in endurance racing. That's what it's all about. And that's why we watch this thing, not only because the thing about it, it's not only 
only about your situation right now, but it's also about where you'll be in uh, two hours time, in four hours time, in six hours time, and what times you need to be doing in order to be where you want to be, ideally in the victory lane in uh, eight hours time. So it's very, very exciting to see these changes in lap times, especially in these conditions, Alex, because these condi conditions mean that the difference between a good driver and great driver, it's no longer one second, it's five. Yeah, exactly, of course, especially for some of these cars. And a lot of the time you'll also see the this is where the GT3 cars will maybe start to be a, a bit more difficult to get past, especially with the fact that they do have the anti-lock braking system, the ABS system that allows them to, well, you know, for a start, not lock the brakes coming into the braking zone of some of the, uh, some of the uh, corners here, which means that their braking performance isn't really lost on them here. So the lap times for at least GT3 stay somewhat similar, although the grip does drop. Uh, we did see earlier, actually, that Calvin Reinhardt did have his accident. He is back on circuit, and he's now circulating, still buried in the GT field. Enzo Fati, obviously, out of this race, dropping down through that field now in terms of the order. Just trying to see if anyone is relatively close to anyone else. We did have uh, Volta Pelesny pretty close to the back of Alvaro Martinez, but that car has dropped back due to Pelesny dropping into the pit lane. Trying to see if anyone else is relatively close to each other because LMP2 is separated by about three or separated by a long way actually at the moment I think it's about two or three laps now um, in terms of the intervals at least so interesting to see at the moment but what is also interesting is to see Thomas Hins back in a car on R Factor because he has not really raced on R Factor since the virtual Enduro Championship Le Mans last oh sorry this year uh in a gt car so it's good to see him in a hyper car here with scuderia basilia yeah it is it's absolutely it's uh the great great to see those guys coming back and great to I'm, i always love a good comeback you know when guys decide that you know what i'm not quite done yet you thought i was done you brought me out but then they spend maybe six months maybe a year out of uh, out of racing out of competitive uh, sim racing and then decide you know what i still have something to give and i can really relate to that sort of feeling where you decide that you know I'm, I don't want to roll over. I'm not quite dead yet. I still have something to give, and you go out there to prove it. <laughs> you're calling, saying that he's, he's rolling over, saying I'm not quite dead yet, Arsene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think he'll really appreciate that when I tell him when he finishes his stint. I'll go, oh, yeah. One of our commentators here at GDR 24 says, you're not quite dead yet. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, to a com in fairness, to a commentator, is a driver truly alive if he's not racing? I mean, who said he's not racing? He races elsewhere, race or I racing in a set of course of competizione. So you're you're basically assuming that he does nothing but R2. <laughs> but we know where the, we know where the real competition is, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that real competition is here at the GTR 24 Endurance E Racing World Championship, and it has been all race. It has been absolutely phenomenal action, especially through the first part of the race and even into the night. And of course, as the track gets wetter. The racing gets closer, the more mistakes come through, and the cars oh. end up grouped up. Oh, you had such a great chance there. When the track gets wetter, the racing gets better, but no. Look, I've not been up long enough to be able to think of these two the, the good puns and the good wordplay yet, I'll see it's, it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just rhyme. I thought, you know... Oh, you've been up rhyme. and commentating for at least two hours now, my good friend. I've been up for oh. about an hour. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I thought Surrey rhyming slang or something was a thing over at the UK, but uh, is that actually a thing still? Yes, it Surrey is. It just means slang. that we have to be awake for more than half an hour before we actually, our brains actually engage on the matter. Ah, yeah. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So, uh, going, going back to racing, you mentioned earlier something about this. Uh, this is going to be a mess, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did tell you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, mentioned something about uh, lacking close battles. Well, the one I still want to keep my eye on is what happens to Alvaro Martinez once he is done with his pit stop, because the number 51 uh, leading the GDE class, I think it was a little bit closer, uh, but he's obviously on a bit of a different pit cycle. They went... Uh, slow car. Oh. oh, we have a slow car on track as well. Trying to from... figure out where it is because we get the oh, slow track. car. 
But yeah, no, we know it's on track. Well, if it wasn't on track, I'd be a bit worried because that means it's either in space or it's on the grass or underground. Yeah, exactly. But the uh, plus side is that the race control wouldn't have to warn about it. So yes, we do have a car in sector two. Slow car in sector two. And try and figure out which car is the slow car because I've heard that the GT3 leader has a bent steering, which is the 777 Nightmare. But that car is still running at a racing speed. And of course, that car being the 777 Nightmare car, they have been doing really well. They have just 13, kept out. Please the hit the pit limiter. And it's the number 13, which car, from what I can Slow see. car in sector 3. Yeah, it's the Danish Sim Racing, one of the Danish Sim Racing teams. Uh, Ferrari GT3 car, ah, with no rear wing no on that car. I was going to say no rear wing on my wagon, but I think that's more safer when the car's only got three wheels on it. But of course, they are only just making their way. Oh, and a puncture as well, apparently. So yeah, Abby, you couldn't get punctures in the effects too. Maybe that's a new thing. Yeah, so the number 13 Danish Racing League car, they had troubles earlier on as well. I watched them uh, last in they were having a lot of issues in the last sector and apparently having issues once again getting that car around the track. So maybe a setup that doesn't suit the wet weather so well, maybe something ultra car aggressive in the car. 13, please hit the speed limiter. So once again being told to hit the speed limiter and apparently they're not quite listening Thank there. You. So now finally on that limiter and having to throttle their way around very slowly. Now, I mentioned earlier, Alex, how dreary it is to practice Le Mans all by yourself because these guys are doing incredible amounts of practice something like you know tens if not hundreds of hours just for this event per driver you know tens of hours set up work practice getting consistency and so on and Le Mans is not the most exciting track to race all by yourself it's the 24 hours where it truly comes alive imagine doing Le Mans and the Porsche curves against the speed limiter I mean Imagine doing a formation lap under the uh, pit lane speed limit erosion. That takes about 15 minutes to actually complete. 15 Ooh. limits of this circuit. Yeah, I mean, if it's 60 k's an hour, well, that would be 10, that would be exactly the amount of kilometers it is. So it would be 13.8 minutes. Oh, Wait, no. <laughs> so that car's gonna be going, that car's gonna have a 13 minute trek back to the Slow pit lane. Car in the Porsche curve. Slow car in the Porsche curve. And they are in the Porsche curve. See, that is also the third place. One echo car going by. That car almost back onto the lead. Actually, no, that car is... Uh, no, it's not. It's one lap down still. But that car has been fighting back after an engine issue early on. And it was about with 10... Uh, with about, sorry, about 10 hours into the race that that car had its engine problems. And Ricardo Costa, Nico Bartley, Borja Milan, and Chris Shepard have brought that car back from what was seemingly the dead with three laps down. And there's only a lap down. I still think they will be at the front of this race, potentially even winning this race by the end of it, Ossian. Could be. I mean, uh, being two laps down or one lap down at this stage doesn't really mean too much when we have changing conditions and when we Car still have so much time left to go. Track. So we are now being hearing that the car number 13 is being told to move off the track. So uh, apologies to the crew of 13. I know we've been focusing on her issues a lot lately, but uh, when a car is slowly making its way back to the pit lane, then it is the most interesting thing that's happening right now on the track. So we are going to talk about that a little bit. They are now safely out of the way. Good job by the crew and good job getting the car back on back or back to the pit lane and hopefully repaired and going out once again, because how much would it suck to leave your Le Mans at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. or whatever it is uh, in Denmark, so it would be 4 a.m. right now, and uh, leaving the Le Mans with eight hours to go in the middle of the night with the last picture of your team being your car throttling slowly back to the pit lane. You don't want to end it that way, do you? I don't think I'm going to respond to that, mainly because the of the fact that that is exactly what happened screen. with my own team, Ossian. So let's let's leave that sour subject away for now. That may have been on purpose. <laughs> I thought it was. 
<laughs> oh, I hate not, you. <laughs> I'm not even with you for 20 minutes and I'm already hating you for this. <laughs> I have to affect on people. I'm a people person. What can I say? So, <laughs> on, on the footage right now, we have uh, Sandro Balestoros currently sitting P number 3 in with that 68E team Brit car on the hypercar class and of course overall classification as well. Now, just to tell you, illustrate how difficult these conditions are, last lap time for that team was at 3.54.1. Their fastest lap time is 3.23.5. They're half a minute slower per lap right now due to the rain, due to the conditions than they would be on dry. And Alex, you said you were here last year. I know you've been racing in rain as well. Well, I assume you've been racing in rain as well. So what are the challenges there? Well, again, obviously the track grip does just completely drop in terms of actual grip. Even with the wet tires that we do have, it is is increasingly difficult, especially when the cars are do lack that beautiful ABS feature, because you're finding yourself braking even further and further and further before than you probably would have been, you know, in the dry. So, especially for the hypercar guys, because in the dry, the hypercars are yeah, very, very fast. In the wet, however, you notice they are doing times slower if you know it's not slower if you know sort of equal if not slower than lmp2 and maybe even almost gt cars sometimes and these guys in the hypercars are actually slower through corners than gt cars because they just don't have the speed to get the downforce working in the wet yeah, and I mean, when you lack downforce, when you don't have those uh, electronic aids helping you and you're racing on a wet surface, well, do you know what you really need in order to be fast? And I'm gonna speak a little bit of Spanish here. I mean, it varies, you know, different, you know, from like team to team driver to driver, because sometimes some drivers can be quicker in, in wet in certain ways and others can be quicker in others. Uh, it's it's an interesting topic, and I think it's one that we'd have to get a driver in, you know, a, pro, like a driver who's been out there on track currently in these sort of conditions, because again, it does vary. And it also varies track to track and car to car. So again, the Porsche driver is going to be having a different way about things than say, you know, the Ferrari drivers or the Corvettes or even the McLarens. Yeah. So especially because the Porsche does adore being in these conditions, although that is Felipe Caneo going off at Mulzahn Hep and getting very very squirrely under braking. Again, what I was saying, that car not featuring. ABS, so very, very difficult. And that car is actually fourth in LMP2 at the moment, a lap behind the 007 Pro Sim car, which is actually only 20 seconds off of the number 17 Pinsim Driller's Esports car now. So they are slowly but surely, you know, I think working their way towards the, uh, the, third, the second place potentially. Yeah, I think you might be right. Uh, running on board with them right now, the Prosim car. Uh, 21 seconds, 22 seconds the gap. By the way, my original response, that was surprisingly serious of you, and I'm proud of you about that one, because I was going to say you need Grande Cajones in the wet conditions uh, See, the with those cars. the difference there, my, uh, my good friend, is that I am mature in my uh, responses here. And I know instantaneously my team's Discord is about to blow up with them saying, how much am I going to lie on the broadcast? That's a clip. That's a clip. <laughs> Uh, I know there are still some very hardcore guys in my team watching this and making sure that I don't say anything stupid. And I guarantee you that has already been clipped for you, uh, Ossian. So I'll send it to you when it does get clipped. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, anyway, the 007 Pro Sim is... Uh getting some really good lap times actually right now. I'm not surprised, I shouldn't be surprised about that. Uh, no idea who's behind the wheel of that one, mind you, because I think they are racing from the same location. But, well, last time around, I say good lap times. Last time around, they did a 3.54.3, which was five seconds slower than Ernest Lapins in that number 17 car. But this time around, they've been seeming to catch the catch that uh, catch that gap a little bit rather shrink that gap if i get my english language in order i hate your language <laughs> <laughs> thanks oh cool. considering our language is formed from scandinavians and also i think even from the village it's actually formed by um, a mixture of uh the scandinavian languages alongside the germanic language and the french and the italian and the greek and the I was going to say the American, but no, we formed their language and they butchered it. Um. <laughs> I agree with you on that one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the 
thing is, uh, being formed from Scandinavian languages doesn't really help me, because, excuse me, I'm gonna get language geek uh, for a moment here. Bear with me, viewers, no, bear with God, me, we're I'm gonna get back to raising soon. <laughs> let me sit back, okay. let me grab a drink. <laughs> yeah, Girl, sure. Professor yeah, Ocean is here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Finnish is not a Scandinavian language. It's nowhere even close to uh, Swedish or Norwegian or Danish. It's actually a Finno-Ugric language, which is its own language group, and there are only three countries in Europe which have a, a Finno-Ugric language as their primary language, and those are Finnish, Estonian, and the last one may surprise you. Do you want to take a guess? Uh, it's got to be a country that's known for memeing, so, um... Further south than you would think. Turkey? Not quite so far. <laughs> halfway, halfway. <laughs> if you look at Finland and Turkey, about halfway through, that would be it. I was going to say Poland for a minute. You're close. Ukrainian? Uh, closer. Uh, hang on, let me get my map in order. Oh, well, yeah, this is, where, this is where I am actually closer than I think, and you're just leading me in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, a uh, little bit more to the center, maybe. Uh, you want a commonwealth that was uh, formed with Austria back in the day. Hungary. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, so Hungarian and Finnish are actually cousin languages, which is uh, really weird because when you look at the map, they're not really close to each other, but there you go. So now you know that Finnish language is a finno ukrainian language, and that's why it's so weird. Uh, welcome to your local geography and languages lesson here with uh, Profession, uh, with uh, if I can get my English language correct myself. <laughs> with I told you I hate it. <laughs> now you hate it too. <laughs> with, profession, uh, with Professor Pohaka. Um, <laughs> I don't know, if I'm going to put you in this language, man. I might as well put your surname as well. <laughs> oh, we're not even 30 minutes into this. <laughs> into this two exactly. hours. Exactly. We're going to be we're going to be here for a long, long time. We are, but uh, let's not worry about that. I am. I've been actually looking at those laptops. I've been actually focusing on the race while we've been chatting away and. Uh, Looking at those LMP2 category lap times, well, once again, the Pro Sim just can't handle the pace of Pin Sim Drillers Esports. Last time around, five seconds slower once more, but you know, one man who is on an absolute tier of a pace, number five, Burst Esports. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but Dennis Jordan. Last time around, I know I shouldn't be focusing too much on lap times, but 349.5. The second fastest, uh, they were actually the second fastest in that LMP2 class, only after the number 17. Not only that, but they are catching absolute handover fist over their competition. The gap to 33 Philip Caneo in that drive game seat car, it's only 17 seconds, so we might get a battle there soon enough. Yeah, it would not surprise me. Dennis Jordan absolutely with a hammer down. Of course, this team, one of the fastest, if not the fastest for the majority of the race, especially in the dry period. And then, well, the heavens opened, the disconnect came through, and then they were on the back foot. Obviously, three laps behind the leading LMP2 car, but only 19 seconds, as you said, Oshin, behind the 33 Filippo Canal, which would actually put them into fourth place. Meanwhile, the 007 Pro Sim car has made their way into the pit lane from third. Obviously, they're not going to lose that position uh, in the pit stop cycle because they have a two lap advantage over the 33 car. That they do, so they can make their pit stop, and that might explain some of the plummeting in lap times if their tires were absolutely worn out. Do you think anyone's crazy enough to double stint tires in these conditions? Um, probably. There are probably some teams that are a bit insane like that. It uh, wouldn't surprise me. I think, again, the only real difference issue here is the thermal degradation. So as long as the tires aren't uh, too cold or, you know, too overheating, then everything should be fine. Meanwhile, Dennis Jordan now in traffic coming into the Porsche case. That is the 777 DSR Nightmare car in front of him as he comes out of the final chicane, puts the power down and goes past the Corvette. Again, it still annoys me that we've got 
we've got, you know, three GT3 Callaway Corvettes, but no factory GT Corvettes here. Like, we've got all of, like, the privateer, you know, sort of company Corvette, but not the actual main one. Yeah, but that's the way it is. Uh, good things are worth the wait. I'm personally waiting for a lot of things, uh, especially more hypercars once they do start to come out. Nothing against the McLaren Senna, because not only is it an awesome name and uh, an awesome car, but also seeing more hypercars around. We were just drawling over hypercars with Ewan earlier on before you came on, Alex, and it's, it's, it's going to be a great thing. Well, That's thank gonna, God I'm the know, same one of the group then that isn't too bothered by the hypercar class. Although, really? well, if, although if Arthax 2 does manage to get the license to click in house, then my opinion will change. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Because, you know, click in house hypercar and the prospect of a Koenigsegg hypercar. There's is a Bugatti one that's been testing this week oh. as well. Yeah, so those are just some of the prospects that I'm really drawing about, along with the Aston Martin, the McLaren, and all those things. I mean, that's that's just gonna be fantastic once those guys take on the track with a storm. And you know, on the bright side, once again, the hypercar rules. Some people have been criticizing them. I'm personally looking forward to them, and I think the change was needed. And you know, it's gonna be a great thing for endurance racing at large. But of course, opinions differ, and the wrong opinions are not listened to. So there you go. So no one's going to be listening to you for the entirety of the broadcast, then, I'm assuming. Exactly, that's what I'm banking on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are doing actually a healthy service to our viewers in a sense that, you know, put Ossian in during the night so people <laughs> would actually get some sleep. In. A voice so calm, but so hilariously stupid that you can fall asleep without an issue. <laughs> Ossian for Harker. The exactly. thing you need to fall asleep here in the early hours of the morning at Le Mans. Uh, the superhero you don't want, but you deserve. Well, I think. the superhero <laughs> that we do That's want and man. do deserve, Ossian, is the everlasting commercial break, which we're going to go to now. And we will be back in a few minutes' time with the next half hour of the GTR 24H Endurance E Racing World Championship finale here from Le Mans. The Endurance E-Racing World Championship Le Mans 24 Hours is brought to you by ESR Esports Network, Tweet Gaming, Sim Lab, Cusingfeld, Simplexity, Aston, and AMD Ryzen Radio. Simplexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. There are three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization.
gentlemen, and welcome back to the GTR 24H. 24 hours of Le Mans here in the finale of the Endurance E-Rating World Championship. I'm Alex Skinner, joined by the ever-favorite fin of mine, Ossian Puhaka. Yes, I am indeed present in this commentary booth. <laughs> Hello, Kimmy Ragam. I didn't realize you'd come to join us. How was uh, the F1 season? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not my Kimmy impression. That's uh, Valtteri Bottas, Robotas, of course. Uh, the Kimmy impression would go something along the lines of... <clears throat> Hello, I am delighted to be joining you today. <laughs> So <laughs> oh, it's a shame I've only got you for another half hour. It seems that the comment seems that the uh, the management team behind the scenes here can only deal with us two on the booth for half, for an hour at a time, Austin, because obviously you're here until 5 a.m. local time, in which case I then am joined by you, and and then well, I leave, I, I leave, I leave for an hour. You come in, and then we come back together for an hour with me and you again. So it seems that even the manager can't deal with us being together for more than an hour at a time. Exactly, but we're not the class clowns, we're the court chesters, because Denmark, of course, is a kingdom. <laughs> I'll stick with that one, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll give you that one. <laughs> uh, Sandro Balesteros right now on screen with the E-Team Brit number 68, if uh, we're briefly getting back on actually the pictures on screen, and we can look at some of the results at this very moment on the hypercar category. And well, on the hypercars, it's the top class, and it's mostly been the number 10 Pinsim Drills eSports uh, that have been, Alex, uh, controlling this race. And uh, they haven't really gotten much screen time, but we can at least talk about that team for a bit. Yeah, exactly. The starting driver is currently in that in that car and the 47 Seawolf Netrace Motorsport car. And it was the other way around at the very start of this race, but it seems... Give me a moment, sorry. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Carrying on. It does seem... It does, <laughs> it does seem that over time, the tables have turned and the uh, number 10 Pins and Jellies Sports car has managed to amass a monumentally large two-lap gap over the Seawolf car. See, at the time of the lead swapping, it was your own Fakel at the wheel of the number 10, and it was also Ben Crooks at the wheel of the 47. But now the starting drivers are back in. We might start to see the times go the opposite way. You know, last time I've seen such a great recovery, I was watching a WRC broadcast, so I'll give you that one. So, <laughs> but yeah, the number 10, it's a Dutch team, actually, Pinsim's Drillers Esports uh, in that number 10. And those guys, really an impressive performance, to be honest, because so far they've been almost flawless. Uh, Timotej Antonovsky, Henry Senik, of course, driving that car, as is Sharon Kriegel, who, who we were talking to earlier, and Martin Hemmingsen driving for them as well. And uh, at least Sharon was really, really, really positive. Uh, you know, when when it started raining, we had him for an interview with Uwen earlier, and he was sounding absolutely calm, like he was like, yeah, it's raining, we're doing everything, progress proceeds as normal. And I can't imagine, Alex, it's like that for everything. Well, not for everyone, no, but for some drivers, they just are more comfortable in the wet than others. I know that, you know, for example, Dennis Jordan, Yannis and Chip, two of the calmest drivers that you can get in the wet. And I think, you know, a lot of teams and drivers are like that as well, especially Thomas Hins, although I can just imagine Hinsey at the moment catching up to every GT car that does something in the realms of stupidity. And uh, I can imagine what's being said over the team radio. It's uh, not fit to be aired over the broadcast, but I can definitely tell you that every single Aussie I've ever come across has always has a very comedic team radio. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's um, it's something that happens even to the guys who you don't expect it from. Because I've been part of a couple of uh, sim racing stables, mostly Finnish ones actually, which might surprise you considering I am from Finland. So, <laughs> no. uh, Finnish sim, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Finnish sim racing teams, you know, Finns. When you think about Finns, you think about calm people, the Iceman, you know, Mika Hakkinen, well, Kimi Raikkonen, well, 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 all those I, I, I wouldn't say that exactly. I mean, we've heard Kimi swear enough or be, you know, angry enough. 
Yeah, I mean, the steering wheel and all that, but yeah, you, usually you tend to think of Finns as calm people, uh, Nordic people in general as calm people. But I've heard some, you know, I, I tell you a little secret, we get as angry as anyone else if something doesn't go our way, and I think the problem with... Uh, uh, a lot of the top drivers is that they're perfectionists and they also accept per expect perfection out of uh, that was a difficult one to get up, uh, get out of my tongue so expect perfection perfection uh, from their fellow drivers as well so you know when somebody does something remotely well, I wouldn't say stupid, but somebody does something unexpected or just is just being slower than usual or just makes mistakes or something. You, you're so quick to point fingers at them because not only do you expect perfe perfection out of everybody else, but you also kind of, you know, expect perfection from yourself and you want to have an excuse as to why you were two seconds slower that time by. Well, it was the GD card, don't let me pass. And uh, which, uh, from which point we also get to the everlasting war that is indeed a war between GD and uh, prototype dri drivers. That is also an interesting phenomenon that I've been observing <laughs> over these years. I'm not quite Stephen Fry. I do, however, try. Never change, Oshia. Never change. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's one of those situations where you find yourself um, on the edge of the cliff and you know you have to jump into the lake. But uh, you're at the edge, there are people lining up behind you, and you realize that oh, you put sorry, yourself... Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to cut you away there, Oshin, because oh, looking you. at the screen, Dennis Jordan is on the back of the 33 of Filippo Caneo coming up through the Dunlop chicanes. They have got, I believe that is the leading car in front of them in the LMP2 category as they come down through the S's. They've just gone past the number 13, Danish Sim Racing, a Ferrari, and these guys are now going to be locked into battle, of course. Dennis Jordan, the quicker of the drivers at the moment, he had a lap. I believe Caneo might have just come out of the pit lane as well because it was a 3.58 for Caneo and a 3.50.9 for Dennis Jordan. Jordan, but we will see as these guys make their way onto the Mool's Arm straight ride on board with Dennis Jordan in the offset on your screen. More traffic ahead, a couple more GT cars to get past, but Dennis Jordan potentially eyeing up the move into the first of the chicanes. He goes to the right hand side, down the inside. Onto the brakes. I wouldn't be too surprised if Caneo backs out of this one and Caneo has to go straight on through the chicane. Dennis Jordan one, Filippo Caneo nil. Yeah, that was a, well, that was a not quite a match, but that was a game and set uh, pretty much. Dennis Jordan getting that done as easy as is as is possible, really. On a straight line, you get the draft and then you get the overtake. So that's a well done by Dennis Jordan getting himself one place up the order, continuing his charge to regain the class lead he once had and then lost. So, you know, the number five doing really well so far. Now, I would like to direct your attention. If we jump back on board with Dennis, I know we have it up on the other screen. So if we jump on board with Dennis, because uh, there is an interesting feature I would like to point out especially to the viewers who don't happen to be, you know, familiar with the power of these cars. Uh, power of these cars, because these do over 300 kilometers an hour, even in the rain. You can see it on the uh, bottom right-hand side of the steering wheel. You can see the speedometer in kilometers an hour. If you speak miles an hour, then I'm sorry, you speak the wrong unit. But that's case an hour there. And even here, in pouring rain, you can see the windscreen wiper going back and forth. You can see him absolutely gripping the steering wheel there at over 300 k's an hour, shifting up to a higher gear in pouring rain. Just imagine what happens if you go a millimeter off the line, if you touch the curb a little bit too hard, if you miscalculate your braking zone at 300 k's an hour, if you miscalculate your braking zone, it's done. You're far. Well, yeah, especially when the track starts drying up as well, because it's notorious, especially on the R Factor 2 platform, that when that dry line forms, if you get those soft tires even slightly on that wet line, the car is going to go around on you in very, very quickly indeed. And as he, Dennis Jordan makes his way down towards the Porsche Curves once more, let's see what the weather's looking like, because I know for a fact that we are still in the middle of, of that very heavy rain. And you can see there we've got even more coming. It's not looking 
looking like it's going to clear up for another few hours at the very least. That rain period moving across very, very slowly indeed. So plenty of time and plenty of rain left. It might not even clear up until the very end of this race. Indeed, we are looking at light rain conditions up, up, up until the morning at Le Mans here. Uh, humidity at 95%, wind coming from uh, wind heading southwest at 5.5 meters per second. The air temp is cozy, 22 degrees Celsius. Track temperature right now 29 degrees Celsius. And expected rainfall is 3 millimeters per hour. So it really is pouring down at France. Back to you, Alex, for the sports news. <laughs> Well, in uh, the uh, football leagues, it's going to be the Eagles that will take it. No, never mind. Let's not go down that road of uh, American football. Looking at some of the other uh, classes, we're trying to have a look now and see if anyone's actually getting any closer, getting any further. Everyone still seems to be relatively well away from each other. Remember, North, so Dennis Jordan's already pulled seven, 18 seconds on Filippo Caneo, who has just come into the pit lane. That'll be why. Fair might ignore me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was thinking that has to be a pit stop, so, you know, <laughs> uh, he's fast, but he's not quite that fast still, you know, I'm just having the Dennis Jordan on board uh, with me on the other screen and just watching him, you know, because it's uh, quite mesmerizing, really, how he's able to pilot this car around this wet circuit, and you can really get a good sense of how much, or rather, how little you can see around there, because it's pitch black, and while you can see something out of the cars due to the powerful headlights, due to some of the floodlights around the circuit, it's still, you know, some of the breaking points are illuminated, but overall during the night, the darkness is one of the key things. And okay, it may sound a little silly uh, because these guys have been doing a lot of practice. Everybody knows this track by heart. I'm sure even if they were had no floodlights, they could still do it. But darkness has also has a mental effect on you. That's very well observed. You start to feel more tired, and especially at this time of the race. I know I've, I've done 24-hour races. You've done 24-hour races, Alex, and uh, I'm not sure if you've ever done a 24 hours of a 24-hour race, but you started some. You've been able to last uh, at least five minutes, which would make my ex-girlfriend proud. And, nope. uh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, uh, it, it has that mental effect on you, doesn't it? I mean, in the middle of the night, you just start to feel drowsy and uh, you start to lose concentration at some point. <laughs> oh, why do you do this to me? <laughs> I thought you had enough time to recover, apparently not. That's what she said. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> right, no, I'm out, I'm out of it. No, okay. No. Any, anyway, anyway, going back to, sorry, going back to the racing, I couldn't help myself there. <laughs> going back to racing, um, I mean, the darkness, obviously, because when it envelops all around you, when at the start of the race, and we talked about this with you next as well, uh, you have that excited sense when you're starting a race. You can't really sleep properly. You really like, you know, you're nervous a little bit and especially rookie sim racers they can't even sleep during the race because they're like okay will the car be actually tear when it's my turn to race again but in the middle of the night you get sort of a different sens sensation when you kind of fall into this rhythm and i find that a lot of drivers are actually at their best when they're not thinking about it too much i mean you said like when you're a rookie sim racer you have that thought of is the car going to be alive when i wake up and i mean I've been around sim racing for what seven years, and I still have that thought now. <laughs> I still can't trust. My, still can't trust that the car is going to be alive by the time I wake up. And all oh, that is a spun car in the middle of the circuit through the Porsche curves. Trying to find which car that is. It is one of the BMWs on the track. Number I'm not sure which one it is. I do believe. And that is, it's the Pierre B cars just rejoining there. Had a spin. I think it was a simple spin indeed, but it seems that absolutely everyone is struggling in the way. You can see the Aston has just gone past the uh, ID Sim Sports car. The ID Sim Sport car, sorry. Uh, just making their way through. I believe that is the 166 that's putting a lap on that car. It is indeed. So that car now, a lap back to the car in front. That they are, Dennis Jordan as well, making his way on the pit lane at this present moment uh, in the number five machine. Uh, just making his stop and then getting ready to rejoin once again. And just 
shout out to Dennis Soren. I think he's been in that number five burst edge esport car for the entire duration of my commentary stint. He's been there what must have been close to five hours now, so I can't help but imagine they're finally getting somebody else in there. I mean, I would be surprised to see if Alex Siebel has uh, woken up yet, and it will probably hop into that uh, burst edge esports car. Maybe Ernie yeah, Simicic will make his return into that car. And Jesper Peterson did a lot of the early phase of the race. Meanwhile, a battle that might be forming, uh, my good man, is the fight between Marco Slanzi, uh, Marco Slanzel, and also uh, Ryan Nash. The 33 versus the 64. It's only about a second or so in it. It's about to get a bit bigger because Ryan Nash has just gotten stuck through the Porsche girls behind the Musto GT3 Mercedes. <laughs> Yeah, so that's going to throw a spanner in the works for sure a little bit. But uh, that's when the frustration comes into play. He gets the pass done right now and is able to start closing down the mind, once again. Never mind, he's in the pits. Oh, okay. So we were almost about to have a battle, but then we didn't have a battle after all. And that's a familiar feeling in the commentary boot of an endurance race. But uh, good things are well worth waiting. Mind you, when you were an active racer, you know, uh, anyone who's drew drawn a prototype in Le Mans, at Le Mans will know the feeling of getting stuck behind a GD car at the Porsche curves. It I is mean, just the worst. I, say, I mean, I'm using the GT car that's holding up the prototype through the Porsche curves uh, at the this track in particular so i know the feeling of being the uh the one that's uh giving all the viewers the happiness of seeing a battle just be destroyed in front of them uh do you also know the feeling of a uh, prototype sticking their nose into the porsche curves right i've also known prototypes <laughs> sticking their nose in very stupid places indeed as a gt driver so believe me i'm aware of that situation all too well <laughs> Yeah, I've been on both sides of that story, actually, because I've had the fortune of doing 24-hour races both as a prototype driver and as a GD I driver. Thought you said you were gonna, you, I thought you were going to say you've been on the both sides of the coin of being the uh, prototype that throws it up the inside for no particular reason. Uh, that too. <laughs> I mean, I can't lie. Uh, you know, some people can be a little bit surprising when you see them driving compared to when they're talking as a civilian, but yeah. Uh, as a GD driver, I always felt that the prototypes, you know, why can't they wait for one more longer, because uh, one corner longer? Because in general, like, uh, if you have the option of passing someone into the corner or passing someone on the following straight, you always want to pick the option of passing someone on the following straight, because you will always lose more time going too wide through the corners, even if you get a good entry, than you would just... Uh, wait behind the GD no matter how slow it feels and then just passing him on to the next rate plus you can save a little bit of fuel when you are throttling behind the GD car for just that one corner but as a prototype driver it, you get a whole different view into it you get a whole different mindset where you want to minimize the losses in traffic because contrary to a popular belief you don't gain to time in traffic ever it's impossible to win time in traffic it is however possible to minimize your losses in traffic and that, that should be your aim as an endurance driver always so you know you get two different perspectives which is why i'm saying you know if anyone out there is an aspiring endurance driver try if it's in any way shape or form possible whatever platform you're using whatever racing league you're using try and get both views of it if you have teammates who are driving prototypes and you're a gd driver try to get the prototype view on tra traffic management traffic handling and if it's the other way around well do do it the other way around but uh, basically that not only helps you as a driver to identify in case you do have to switch classes or you just want to improve as a driver but it also helps you in trying to you know figure out what's the best way that we can cooperate in this traffic for you to get past me as quick as possible with uh, both of us losing as little time as possible because ultimately that should be your goal yeah exactly you know it's it's a balancing act but again it's a balancing act that doesn't need to be a balancing act sometimes I think a lot of drivers come into endurance racing from the formula racing scene and seem to be like oh I'm losing like a tenth I need to get past him, otherwise the race is lost. <sighs> but, you know, you look at the race at the moment, you look at, like, Henry Sinek and Ibrahim Khan, for example. That car, those cars were getting stuck behind traffic so many times, especially Henry Sinek getting caught in the worst of places. Um, well, he's leading the race by two laps now, so whatever time he loses in traffic is completely irrelevant. <laughs> 
Exactly. So, you know, it's... Uh, and the thing is, you're losing, okay, half a second in traffic, maybe a second in traffic if you're being too conservative. But what, what you can gain by being a little bit more aggressive or rather, okay, you can maybe gain a tenth or two going past in a spot that's a little bit risky, you can maybe gain half a second. If you gain a second, it might be even worth taking the risk. But then again, the flip side of the risk is that how however many laps and however many minutes uh, you lose by repairing your car in the pit lane and then you get slapped on by a hard penalty from the race officials who are less than impressed by your acts there so you always have to weigh in as you said it's a balancing act and you always have to weigh the, weigh the risk and reward and think about okay what am i truly fighting for what's the long-term game in one hour in six hours by the end of this race is this a battle i do want to fight is this the hill i want to die on usually the answer is no yep exactly and as you we're seeing this right now here with a good few prototype cars coming through on gt traffic one of those being the gte leader the number 53 uh, Musto GD uh, Ferrari and then the third place number 77 one echo cut and then of course some of the LMP2s are being lapped by the fifth place Scuderia Brasilia hypercar which is currently being piloted by the Australian Thomas Hins and currently just having a look light rain still but the humidity is actually rather high 95% humidity uh, at the moment obviously so that rain still looking uh, rather close uh, rather rather consistent it is, it is, and it's gonna stay in here for a long time, so sadly I don't think... Uh, I actually wonder if we are going to get that morning fog that usually comes out at La Mo, and... Uh, well, I, I would... I shall think not, but you know, it might be an option here as well, and... Uh, think about how that will affect the race, and the one thing we will miss for sure here, due to this rain, is that beautiful Le Mans sunrise, because we are soon starting to get to the hours, of course, in virtual standard time, we are at the end of June. And that's quite depressing, really, because it's late October in Finland, and I would want it to be middle of June. Thank you very much. Those 20-hour 20 20 days are quite nice, but yes. Uh, so we are starting getting the sunrise surprisingly early, for those of you who might not be familiar with that fact. Yes, indeed. And of course, we'll be getting into the eight hours in the morning very soon, and in the early hours, it'll be myself well, myself and Oshin now, then myself and you, and then you and an Oshin, and then my, and then myself and Oshin again, and then myself and Yusuf to take you to the end of the race. And of course, the five more, uh, five more minutes until we head to our next commercial break. So Oshin, again, for a first experience of each other for, I think, about a year now, actually. I think the last time we personally spoke was the uh, br briefing for the Virtual Endurance Championship 24 Hours of Le Mans last year. It's been a while, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and they had the good, uh, good, uh, good uh, foresight not to put us uh, in the boat <laughs> at the same time uh, back then. But yeah, I mean, I love doing endurance events. I love commentating on them. I used to love driving them as well. Uh, no longer a possibility, sadly. But uh, you know, still commentating them is quite nice. So, and I think you learn something new from every race. In that, okay, you would think that uh, by your fifth, sixth, or seventh. 24 hours of Le Mans, it would get kind of boring, but every day is, in it, is its own story. And once you start to break down the race into individual oh, competitors... Oh, I've on. just seen the 766 Dream Team car has oh. stopped at the Dunlop S chicane. And that looks like that car is missing a rear wheel as that is Hindi drifting it through the tunnel of chicane there. We get an instant <laughs> replay of that as well. Wow. Another car off as well in sector three. Not too sure who that is, but needs to see what happens to the 766 car. Here goes the action replay. One, two, three, and in comes a hypercar sideways oh. into the S's. <laughs> you know who's the other slow car? Who? He's actually in the pit lane right now, uh, coming into the pit lane. I think Sector 3 slow car was the GDE leader, perhaps David Greco in the Musto GDE Esports. Because he's coming into the pit lane right now. It might have been, although I do see... It must have been, because Olivier Fortani is leaving the pit lane in the Simply Race Guard, so that must have been David Greco. What happened to that Musto GD Racing Ferrari? Your championship leaders, remember? And of course, the fact they are two laps ahead of the Simply Race Guard means 
Volta, if they stay this way, they will also be the champions. But Volta, well, let's need, well, I was speaking to Nick Newcomb a few, excuse me, a few hours ago, and he said, well, give us until near bit of seven hours to go him up, and you'll see that Deuce's car at the front of the field, and well, he ain't wrong, that car is now leading by, oh, well, it's going to be leading by a very large margin indeed. It is, and also, thankfully, for our GDE leaders, the Musto GDE Esports, they are out of the pit lane, so... Whatever happened to them must have been relatively minor because that was a fairly quick pit stop and they are out now in the second place in their class right now. So, you know, not losing too much time, uh, nothing out of the window just yet, but certainly a bit of a scary moment to remind you all that these are still mortals. And, you know, we were about to talk earlier about, uh, you know, breaking this down into individual teams, into individual drivers, and then, you know, you can break down a race the story of a race you look at all these competitors we look at the broadcast we get an overview but we don't get to view what a single team is going through all the planning all the practice all that scheduling all the drama that you have in a single stint like all the drama you have in a one hour of racing and then you multiply it by 24 or rather you know do that 24 times in a row and then you think about it on a driver scale you think about it on a team scale and think about all the individual stories so i think one of the most fascinating stories Stories in this race has got to be what the LMP2 leader Chris Gonzalez in the fair racing team is experiencing right now because imagine those guys can't possibly have picked themselves as the favorites I know drivers have to be confident but I don't think they were on anyone book anyone's books at the favorites and with seven hours remaining look where they are in this race they are leading their class and that's the best you can do in an endurance race so you know those guys hats off to them good luck to them as well for the rest of the race but just imagine what stories they have to tell after this event yeah, and just imagine the stories that myself and you and are going to tell because we're about to head to a commercial break. Oshin, it has been an absolute pleasure to be with you here for this hour of the broadcast. And, well, I will see you again at 7 in the morning. So it should be daylight at that point. And we'll actually get to see the full beauty of the Le Mans circuit in the, wet, in the day. But Oshin, thank you so, so much for joining us here for the longest stint of your life in terms of commentary here in 2024, I feel. But for now, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. When you come back, it'll be myself and you and O'Leary to take you through the next hour of this broadcast. See you in a few minutes.